I want to create more opportunity for women to enjoy this game. You have to understand there are lots of talented girls. We have two labs. Uh, the yellow one is Charlie and the black one is Bubba. I'm a bit of a force to be reckoned with. I am your host, Greg Pattison, and this is The Four Interview with tour pro Kelly Edelblue. It's great to have you on the show. Welcome, Kelly. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on the show today for both my listeners and myself to learn your story. So, Kelly, who are you as a person? Uh, as a person, um, I'm a pretty shy, shy mild-mannered kind of person. I'm very kind and caring. Um, once you get to know me, I open up a lot more to people. Um, I'm also a very passionate person. Uh, which is why I'm pursuing this dream now. I'm very driven, um, very hardworking. When a coach tells me I got to go do something, I give 110% um, and then some. And uh, just, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the kind of person that I am. So true to, true to heart, right? How true about, to heart, uh, absolutely. There you go. How about you as a player? How would you describe yourself as a, as a player? Uh, I'm a very strategic player. Uh, kind of like seeing the golf hole before I even play, kind of, if it's a part four, strategizing four shots ahead. Uh, I always am trying to perfect my craft, uh, even though I know it's not perfectable. Um, you know, I want to win a lot of golf tournaments, but one of the most gratifying feelings is developing a skill and seeing it work under pressure in a tournament. And um, out there, I think in terms of me versus the field, I'm a bit of a force to be reckoned with. I'm pretty long off the tee for somebody who's 5'2". I'm a really good green reader, and when my speed is on, I know that I'm going to drop a lot of putts. And because growing up, I was a bit of a wild ball, um, I definitely know how to make a par from just about anywhere on the golf hole. A force to be reckoned with. I I like that. So <laughs> Plus making a yeah. par, then you can be my partner anytime you're in town because I, you know, I can count on you. <laughs> Yeah, sounds sure. great. I love it. Way to go. So <laughs> five two but long off the tee, right? So you pack yeah. a you pack yeah. a punch. So you mentioned something yeah. real quick here about, you know, developing a skill and you know and, and taking the course. How how long does it typically take you if you're trying to really get something down, master it and, and put it in play and be able to count on it? At this level, yeah, it doesn't take as long as it used to. You know, probably as an amateur it would take me quite a few months to really develop a skill, but Nowadays, I think it's more fine-tuning as a professional, so it'll take me a few days to maybe a couple of weeks to really hone in on something. Nice. So yeah. uh, how'd you get hooked on the game? So actually, I did not grow up in a golfing family. I grew up in a soccer family. Uh, neither of my parents played. We joined Trenton Country Club in Ewing, New Jersey, as pool members when I was about four years old. And when you go down the long driveway, you see golf holes on either side and you see the driving range. And I was always kind of mesmerized. So one day when my mom was watching my little sister, Katie, at the time, under the shade of an umbrella, I decided that I was done swimming. And without telling mom, I decided to go in the locker room, change, and walk across the street to uh, go watch them play. And the head pro, Denny Milne, saw me standing there and asked if I wanted to try. And... When my mom finally came up and found me worried sick, if you're listening, mom, sorry. Um, she said, come back down to the pool. He said that uh, he would bring me back down when I wore myself out, which probably wouldn't take that long. Uh, next thing I know, I'm closing down the range that day. And um, the rest is kind of history from there. So you were a force to be reckoned with from the get-go then, is what you're telling us. I was. Right out Golf of the has gate. always been absolutely something that is – for me, yeah. nobody else. That's uh, that's officially hooked on the game. It really is. Nice. I could not be more hooked. <gasps> so you grow up, and that that happens fast. I'm a parent, so I realize you you, you crank through that. Uh, you mentioned your mm-hmm. family doesn't play golf, but you got a, uh, a a lot of athletes that played a lot of collegiate golf. I think I read in your bio there's like six of your family members played you know sports at the collegiate level. I definitely come from a very athletic or active background. Okay. Nice. So what was it, what was, uh, 
What was it like to play golf at William & Mary? It was great. It was a very, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to play golf at such a great public Ivy League school. Um, the golf courses there are beautiful, and we were very lucky that our home event was always at Kings Mill, where they have the LPGA event. So I love going down there in May and playing that Monday qualifier, trying to get in that tournament. It's been close a couple of times now, and I think it's, I'm pretty close. I'm going to make it. Is it um, still to happen this year? Is that, have they already played it, that It one? happened. They play it in the spring. They play it in May. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll follow, um, we'll follow you and watch for you to get in next May. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. And I believe in Mary. I also got to play my senior year with my sister, Katie, who came in as the only freshman at the time which was a really cool experience. What, uh, so I got to ask you, who's, who's better? Uh, we get that question a lot. We don't like <laughs> to sure. answer that. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> likes to answer that. That's why I asked you. Nobody's like, wait a second. So I, I just, I well, think... if you can grind out the pars, I, you probably got it, you know, even, even more so. Cause when your sister comes up, you're like, all right, I, I really got to step on the gas here now. Yeah, it might be me at the moment just because she's decided to take a job in D.C., but I'm very, very happy for her. And she actually, in all honesty, had a better collegiate career than I did. So I guess collegiately she was the better player. But you're uh, – it's, well, it's glad to hear she's, she's doing something she apparently loves to do now, and so are you. So it worked out for both of you. Absolutely. So what's your biggest takeaway from playing golf in college at WM? Oh, you definitely learn time management um, at a school like that. Uh, students definitely you have to learn how to balance the academics before the athletics and um, it's definitely not an easy blend uh, senior year it really kind of started to mesh together for me nobody really tells you how to do it you just kind of have to kind of experience it and then figure it out as you go okay so for the girls that are, you know, well, should probably be back in school now, or I think, I think school's just about starting for, for the girls, what, uh, what would advice would you give them? Um, I would just say if it's something that you absolutely love, then pursue it. It doesn't even matter if it's, whether it's golf or not. Just you need to pursue what you love. Um, I, I think that this is a tremendous opportunity to play professionally because you – not only get to play the game that you love, but you meet a lot of amazing girls along the way that have such a great common interest among all of you. And um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm friends with Anna, who I know you did a podcast with as well. And um, it, it's just a lot of fun traveling on the road with these ladies. Yeah, I bet. Um, so you mentioned, you know, do do something you're passionate about or you love to do. And obviously you're, you're doing that now. What, um, you know, what, what did, what happened? What did, when did you know you wanted to do this professionally? Um, well, actually for a while, I thought I was going to go into physical therapy or I thought I was going to become a teaching professional, but I knew if I wanted to be a teaching professional, I probably had to have some playing experience under my belt. And, um, it really wasn't until, uh, the spring of my senior year after the season was over, actually, that, uh, my coach said something to me that kind of struck a nerve. I actually knew it myself, but he said, Kelly, you never reached your potential. Uh, it really, really struck a nerve with me, and it was kind of the tipping point that made the decision to play really, really concrete. I knew I had the talent to play, and I wanted to prove to not really him so much, but to myself that I had the potential to play well. Um, so I decided to uh, play professionally right after that. Well, how about them apples? So, yeah. <laughs> did it, um, how do I want to ask that? I was going to say, uh, you know, do you think he believed it or it was just, this is what I need to say because I, I know it's in there and if I just poke her this way, it'll happen? I think it was a poke. Uh, Jay is a great coach. Um, I think he just knew that I wasn't happy with the way that I finished my career and for him to give me that little poke to nudge me in the right direction to continue to play. It was, it was actually a blessing and I thank him very much for that. Yep. All right. Thanks coach. We, uh, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we appreciate it too. Cause we're going to get to watch you play now. So thanks coach. That's right. So let's, let's fast forward a little bit into your, into your pro career and you know, what, what do you consider your, your biggest highlight so far? Um, my career so far, I think, has been a gradual 
incline into um, really seeing the potential. But this year, uh, despite the fact that it was a very up and down year for me, I actually had some pretty high ups. I had two tournaments this year where I was holding the lead going into the final round. One was a mini tour event and one was actually just a few weeks ago at the South Carolina Women's Open. Um, it really just proved to myself that the hard work that I've been doing is paying off. And if I continue to work, especially on my self-management, that there is a W in my future. I just got to stay patient. So the, so the question that usually gets asked, you see in the interviews is, you know, if it, if it doesn't get closed out, right, when in a position that it's a learning experience and you're ready for the next time, and, and obviously you did, what, what is that actual learning experience? What was the takeaway from, you know, taking the lead into those two days? And so when you get in that position again, you'll be ready to get the W. It's a matter of just staying calm. I think that, um, you know, when you go into competitive tournament golf, you're already a little bit anxious and excited to be out there. Um, but in a position like that, you're even more so because you can almost see yourself holding the trophy. You can almost see yourself at the end trying to – it's almost – a validation to hold that trophy at the end. Um, and, you know, if there's a part of you that feels like if you don't necessarily get that, then you, you failed, but you have to kind of stay patient and remind yourself that it's not about the trophy at the end. It's about the process along the way that gets you to that. Um, so remain patient, remain calm, run your process and just play your game. Just let the athlete take over and eventually things will just kind of work themselves out. And just just keep doing what you did that got you there, huh? Exactly. Yeah, I, I uh, I'm obviously I'm not playing at your level, but uh, I kind of was the same way. I had a chance uh, club championship this year. I've won it before, but this year I was I was uh, final group. Kind of, I knew I could get the better of both the guys, and uh, I just I was one, I was one step ahead when I should have paid attention to the step I was on. <laughs> So it's crazy, man. You, I'm 47. You still learn, right? So well, that's oh, wonderful. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. So now that you're on tour, you said it's been a gradual process. You're kind of growing along and learning the different things. What do you find, you know, to be the most challenging part of, of making it on tour now or trying to make it on tour at least? Yeah. At this level, um, you have to understand there are lots of talented girls, and it's awesome. And like I said before, it's a lot of fun to meet them and to play golf with them and travel with them. Um, but everything at this point comes down to finer details and a few inches. Um, you know, a couple more feet closer in proximity on your approach shots, an extra fairway hit, one more putt made. Those are the kind of differences that can determine whether you win a golf tournament or if you even make the top ten. Um, so it's really important to keep a perspective, uh, to stay mentally strong and remember that uh, the margin to improve as a professional is so significantly small in comparison to what we were as amateurs growing up where we were still developing skills, we, we were still developing swings, and we could in one year, you know, develop and gain, you know, five strokes in scoring average versus now where we're trying to gain, you know, a quarter of a stroke, a half a stroke in scoring average. It's just, it's just crazy how small the margins are now. So are you are you tracking specific stats and working working that angle or how you getting that part? I done? do. Um, I, I do use a website and an app, uh, Shot by Shot, that calculates my um, you know handicaps in certain areas of my game, like um, off the tee, up and down putting stats, and they take those numbers and they compare them to um, a goal handicap. And for me, I try to compare it to PGA Tour average plus four to plus six. So I can kind of see, you know, whether it's tournament rounds or regular rounds, what the differences are. And I can even go back through the years and determine, okay, when I was playing best in April and May of last year, which was some of my lowest rounds, what was I doing well? And I can go back and kind of figure out what I was doing then and try to do that now. Okay. So what what were you doing well that you're trying to do now? Um, just – Again, mentally, just kind of keep myself in it. I was doing a lot of uh, putting drills. Putting is just everything in this game. Um, I definitely, I had just learned how to do aim point at that point. And um, I was just hitting a lot more fairways off the tee. This year, driver has been a little bit of a challenge for me, but it's definitely coming back around at the right time. So I'm not too worried about that anymore. Okay. You just smack yeah. it down there. You got to get it in the hole. I think they were talking about, 
you know, there's all that talk about rolling the golf ball back. And uh, I think one of Dustin Johnson's comments were, well, you still got to get the ball in the hole. Right? Absolutely. So, you know, putting everything else you do has got to gotta matter. The the aim point piece is, uh, is a good one. I actually had a chance to take that. I took that directly from Mark Sweeney, the guy that invented it. So it's, okay. uh, it works out, works out really well, uh, especially when yeah, it definitely for, does. for me, I find it on the golf courses that I don't play a lot, how much, how much better I've been at reading greens, you know, on the golf courses as I, as I take my game around and try to play other courses. So wonderful. Absolutely. I think there's a misconception with it that aim point takes away from the green reading skill. I think it just confirms feel because you can see a break, but it's nice to be able to like feel it with your feet and compa- like to compare it to what you're seeing visually and say, you know what, definitely have the read now. All I need to do is worry about the speed. Yep. It's awesome. Yep. Wonderful. So, uh, how, how do you approach a tournament round? Let's start. Maybe we, we talked a little bit about the mental game. How do you approach it mentally? Let's start there. Sure. Um, so mentally before a tournament begins, I like to come up with two or three process goals. So, um, for example, in my last tournament, um, my, my process goals were control the controllables. Um, for example, like, you know, hitting chip shots to learn the release before a tournament, um, determining the best setup to maintain the best ball control through the bag, uh, things like that. Uh, another one was, you know, perform with what I have. So it's just taking the opportunity in this tournament to transfer the existing skills I have in this competitive environment and also assess what skills need to improve so I can continue to get better as tournaments go on and then just reacting neutrally. Uh, don't get too excited if things go your way and don't get upset if they don't. That's just the nature of the game. And when I lay out these process goals and I follow them pretty well in a tournament, it allows just the athlete in me to go out there and start ripping drives and just swinging freely. And all in all, it pretty much just works out. And I have those low scores. So control the controllable. Absolutely. I like that. So if you, if you get off track, what do you do to get it back? I kind of I actually write these down on a sheet. And if I get off track, I, I pull these out and I remember them. And I also have a couple of just like positive thoughts, whether it be just like a, a song I've been jamming to over the week or it's thinking about my adorable two lab dogs. Um, just something to kind of distract you from the task at hand and remind you of a happy memory or a moment that uh, kind of centers you again. What are the dogs' names? Uh, we have two labs. Uh, the yellow one is Charlie and the black one is Bubba. They are adorable, and they are about 120 pounds. They're ginormous. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're big farm labs. Yeah? So they, they love to run around and chase, dog, or chase birds and chase rabbits and stuff. Char- Everybody should have a lab named Charlie, by the way. That's a great. Exactly. That's a that's great a, lab name. Absolutely. So, that's cool. All right. So, what's your uh, what's your warm up routine like? Without giving all your trade secrets away, but you know those oh, of us that are getting out there I trying to play it, away. you know what? Uh, right. Uh, what, what What do you absolutely. do? Absolutely. I mean, Tiger's willing so to share that he copied Jack, so I guess you can share that part. Okay. Yeah. So, physical warm up for me it, it, in the morning when I'm waking up, I kind of I've I've learned this year about um, isometric workouts and um, range of motion assessments from David at this uh, gym called Winter's Fitness down in Florida. Basically, I can kind of assess um, what my body needs in the morning. Um, So, for example, I might not be rotating left very well, so I can do a bunch of isometric exercises to uh, make sure that that's happening. And so I do a bunch of core, I do a bunch of bands, and I just – try to get loose in the morning and then I go out to the range and you know I hit a bunch of little chips and I hit a bunch of I kind of go through the bag and then I hit some chips and I putt for a little while and that's that's just pretty much a my basic routine you kind of work your way into it right not too much pressure it's just kind of get looser looser more and more comfortable and then just let it go absolutely and the great thing about these um isometric exercises that I've learned is that not only can I do them in the morning but I can do them throughout the day. So if I'm having kind of pain or discomfort in my shoulder, I, I can kind of assess, okay, is that actually coming from the shoulder or is that coming from somewhere else? Like it can even be coming down from the foot. I was a kinesiology major, so it definitely uh, helped me in this field that I'm in right now. 
But I think it's tremendous what I've learned. Sure. And you got, I mean, you got an advantage of your physical therapy. And you, like you said, you study in the kinesiology. You kind of, you can kind of pinpoint in the body, hey, here's where my issue is right now. And can I kind of exactly. resolve that? I, I just uh, recently interviewed a, a coach there in Florida, Matt uh, Palazzolo um, from the Gary, yeah. Gary Gilchrist Academy. And, you know, he talked a lot about, you know, how he helps people get in their hinge and their hips in the right positions and, you know, some different things that it, it struck me interesting that, you know, I get out there on the golf course and I start having a problem and it's the problem with my body, but I'm trying to make my swing work around it. And it was like, man, maybe I need to be working on some of these other things to get myself in the right position. Like you're talking about these isometric workouts or, you know, you're not turning to the left or your hip or whatever it may be. I think, I think that's, Absolutely. you know, there's definitely something to that. People paying attention to it. Well, it starts with getting yourself in the right position, right? <laughs> Being yeah. Able to if do you're, if sure. you're not moving Absolutely. If you're not moving properly, you're going to compensate in your swing no matter what. It's kind of a game of that as well. So it's a matter of being able to recognize it and adjust as quickly as you can. Yeah, keep the uh, keep the arms from taking over. So That's right. So you play, you know, you get to play a lot of pro-ams, I'm sure. And, and uh, obviously oh, yeah. as, a, as a pro, you know, anybody that's around probably excited to want to play with you <laughs> and, and see what you got. But, you know, what what's the main area – you feel amateurs need to, you know, to focus on to, uh, to improve their game? Oh, it's short game. <laughs> it is definitely short game. Um, you know, I just, I don't, I see a lot of people go to the range for hours on end. And then I, I go play in these pro-ams or I go play with other amateurs and they wonder why they can't make a putt. And on average, you spend 42% of a golf round with the flat stick in your hand. So it's, doesn't make sense to me why I see a lot of amateurs not spending about half of their practice time putting. Uh, you really, the, the saying drive for show, putt for dough, it sounds kind of cheesy, but it's, it's very, very true. And I think that there are a lot of people trying to fix their swing when really they should be just trying to get the ball in the hole. You know, a couple of years ago, I, I played myself a, a fair bit of golf and, you know, I didn't spend time on the range. So I, I agree with you. And the, the pro that was actually helping me get ready to play kind of high level amateur golf you know, people would ask him what he was doing with me, and he would say, do you ever see Greg on the range? No, you only see him in the short game facility and working mm-hmm. on it and playing on the course. So I, uh, I, that great advice. I, I agree with you, Kelly. you got to get out there and be able to uh, get the ball in the hole. <laughs> so Absolutely, that's the that's name of the game. If you spray it off the tee, but you can get up and down, man, you know, I, I play with some guys that are crazy at getting up and down, and you are, right, you call it. So a right. force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Nice. Exactly. So – you know, you never get there to the top. I just, again, talked a little bit about a, you know, coach I worked with or, or a pro I worked with, but you never get there to the top by yourselves. Who's, who's kind of helped you along the way? First and foremost, it's, it's my family. You know, despite the fact that they're not golfers, they have been the most supportive people. When I told them I wanted to play professionally, they said, absolutely, dive in, go for it. Um, I also have two great coaches, one in Pennsylvania where I'm from, and one down in Florida, uh, Dom DeGiulia of DeGiulia Golf has been working with me since I was about 13, 14 years old and really helped me to develop not only a swing to go to college, but has been helping me with ball flight management and self-management lately. Uh, and Cheryl Anderson out of Mike Bender Golf Academy uh, has taught me aim point. We did a lot of great work with short game. We've even been working on uh, the swing this year. And I'm so incredibly lucky to have both of them as teachers. Neither one of them is an ego. So it's a great balance between the two of them. And they're also just great people. Um, David Rubin of Winter Fitness, as I told you earlier about the isometric exercises, uh, that's just been a game changer this year. Scott Shepard of the Mike Bender Golf Academy. His workouts have been tremendously important. Uh, Chris Bogras of Clutch Performance up in Pennsylvania. When I go home and visit family, I like working out with him a lot. And uh, he's known me since I was a teenager, too. And then finally, um, just Callaway for supplying me with the equipment, both in college and now, and just giving me the opportunity to, to continue to chase the dream. Well, with, with a team like that behind you, you're, well, you're making it now, but you're really going to make it. That's, that's pretty cool. It looks like you got it all yeah, covered Yeah, I have there. a tremendous team, so. absolutely. Kelly, what, what don't people know about you? that they should know about you? That's a question I like to ask folks. I usually ask at every interview, but I'm really, I'm really curious. What, what don't people know about you that they should know about you? Oh, are you looking for a funny angle or a serious angle? Cause I got both. 
Um, well, we'll take I guess we'll hard... take both, right? We'll take okay, both because I, you know, we want insight into you. I hope uh, you know more and more people follow you. Potential sponsors out there to add to Kelly's team. You know, let's go both sides. Yeah, of absolutely. It. So, um, what people are just starting to learn about me is that um, I am the president of the Players Board for the National Women's Golf Association Tour, or also known as Eglin's Best Ladies Professional Golf Tour. Um, I decided to take on this role last year so that I could help to improve the tour in general, both uh, getting great courses and giving girls more opportunity to make a living on the tour. And um, we have a lot of amazing changes coming in 2019, just to give you a taste of it. Um, there's going to be guaranteed $5,000 first place prizes. Uh, there's going to be $200 player of the month bonuses. And we're even going to travel outside of Orlando to Georgia and the Carolinas to play some amazing courses as well and get more girls from out of state the opportunity to play in tournaments as well. Um, I also, and fingers crossed, this is just talk right now, but I'm trying to help bring back the Pennsylvania Women's Open or potentially create a Mid-Atlantic Open with a couple of other golf associations. I really, really love this game, and it has taught me so many valuable life lessons and just done so many great things for me. I want to create more opportunity for women to enjoy this game and to learn from it, especially the younger, younger generation, and I just get so much joy out of doing what I do. Man, that was a, a very passionate answer, and it's exciting to see Eglin's best come on, and I know that they've made a five-year commitment. I've got to talk to Anna and Kayla and some of those folks about it, but uh, you know what you're doing right. with that? and. Hopefully, I can get you and Scott Walker on, and we can, you know, we can Absolutely. talk in the days I'd about uh, what happens moving forward. So that's wonderful. How about the funny Great, side? Yeah. All right, give us a funny story. All right. Well, you already know I'm a sucker for labs, but um, my my friends love this fun fact about me. When I was younger, I was in chess clubs, <laughs> and I competed in a tournament. And out of 80 kids, I actually ended up winning the tournament. Neither myself nor my parents expected that. So I actually ended up with a national chess ranking. All right. You got a national? Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> that's. It's uh, very random, but it's, yeah. uh, it's my fun fact. There you go. There, there you go. All right. Well, I'm, remind, well me, remind me not to play you in that or if that be the tiebreaker off a golf course, I'll, I'll pass. So. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because – you know, in, in business for years, one of the sayings I like to use, I heard, you know, in chess, they say, see the whole board, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, Absolutely. you know, if you just go back to the answer that you gave about, you know, what should people know about you, that, that really is kind of a see the whole board thing. You're looking at it and trying to do it for yourself, but you're making moves and helping others to try to make it happen. So you are a see a whole board kind of person. Absolutely. So, all yeah. right. So, uh. Where can people see you play this summer? Hopefully, um, I'm going to make the roster and get into the Sioux Falls, South Dakota event shortly after Q School. Um, there's a couple of semester events after that I might get into as well. At this point, I'm kind of just riding the wait list, but I've got some optimism that I will get into those events as well. And then in October, I'm probably going to go up north and play the Maryland Women's State Open and probably slow down my year after that. Okay. The road warrior, doing what you need to do to get it done. Living in a suitcase, getting yeah, it done. Yeah. So is your suitcase <laughs> neatly organized or has it exploded inside? Um, I like to call it organized chaos. Um, okay. I, it's, I've got a lot of clothes in there, but um, I've got everything that I need. So that's really all that matters. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. All right. So... You know, we'll finish here. I like to I like to do these kind of nine. I call it the emergency nine. All right, some fun questions okay. here at the end because, you know, we always we always need more. Those of us that uh, you know get out there and play, everybody knows they need nine more at times, and uh, we need nine right, more, at Kelly. So, okay. all right. So we'll we'll see if we figure this out. I, I had this question. It's kind of you know, as my number one one, but we'll see from what we've talked about. We'll see how you go with this one. So, are you a jokester or all business? I'm a good combination. I'm, I, I'm pretty sarcastic at times, but uh, when it comes to golf, I get pretty serious. Yeah, I get that about you. I, I'd agree. You're, I'd say it's a good combination of both. In my half hour I got to spend with you so far. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. What's your What's your go to shot, Kelly? Oh, high draw, high push draw. 
I love I love seeing that off the tee. It's just so yeah. powerful. Yeah, all right. I like it. Me too. That's my favorite one. All right, top course uh, on your bucket list you haven't played yet. Oh. Oh man, you know, I, I live not too far from TPC Sawgrass. I'd like to go up there and play that course. Okay, we'll get her done. So I, I'm gonna try. <laughs> what major do you feel best suits your game? Oh, that is tough. You know, of the women, I'd, I'd say the A and I, because it's a course that demands you to be long and accurate off the tee, but make a lot of putts because these greens have a lot of subtle breaks on them, and I'm a pretty good green reader, so it definitely is in my favor. Okay, great. All right. Well, let's, we'll write it down and keep it in our notes as we follow you. We'll hope That's for, right. hope for that one to come first. So, all right. Okay. All right. What is the dumbest golf rule out there? Oh, my goodness. Um, the one that they're coming out with uh, about the keeping the flag stick in. Uh, I, just, I just don't see the point of that one. Yeah, yeah you, you're going to take it in and out or, you know, some people, oh, I, I want to back in. You know, just leave it in for the three-footers now, just bang it right into the stick and knock it in. Yeah, you're going to miss putts because of that. Yeah. I understand if you're playing by yourself, but, I mean, it's an it's an honor system, so uh, no, I guess I, it makes sense. I'm with you. That, that one's pretty weird. I, I don't know about the drop at the knee length or whatever, but I'm with you. So. Oh, right. yeah, I'm going to drop by my ankles now. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. It's not really a <laughs> they drop. Basically placed it. <laughs> well, they were I actually. Not, remember, no. they did actually have it as a placing. You were literally like like mm-hmm. one inch or something off the ground, and at least they moved it up to the knee. But you know, who knows? I can see that just going wrong anyway, because oh, amateurs yeah. are going to tee it up and then go right onto the ball. Oh yeah, absolutely. So you got. Yeah. It. All right, what's your favorite thing to do off the golf course? Um, I love being outside. I like to go to the beach a lot. I, I love the beach, swimming in the ocean, kind of just taking some downtime. Well, as, as hard as you think about on the golf course, that's understandable. So oh, yeah. we were thinking about, we talking about thinking, if you got, if you get one hour to pick someone's brain, who would it be? One hour. You got a one hour session with anybody in golf, out of golf, doesn't matter. Who would it be? Okay. Um, that's a good question. I would say, hmm. I honestly can't think of anybody right now. <laughs> um, probably Ben Hogan. Okay. I just, I just want to, I want him to explain his book a little bit more and kind of talk yeah. about his playing career, his game. Yeah. What do you want him to explain in the book? I, I ask because I use the book to get started in the game myself. But what, what do you want him to explain? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because uh, I read the book and then I actually heard some people mentioning that some of the things in the book. I don't remember the exact details, but that they're not exactly what he said. So I kind of just want clarification yeah. as to what he came up with and what was being published. Yeah, I heard that too. So yeah, that, yeah. that's cool. I like that. Great answer. Yeah. So, Thank you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> what's your favorite road trip guilty pleasure? Ooh, probably five guys. Just stopping somewhere and getting five guys. Is it the burger or the fries? You know, the burger's great, but the fact that they just, a small fry is basically yeah. an entire bag. It, it, <laughs> it, it it's is. pretty fantastic. <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, there's seven of us. We'll take one bag of fries, please. Thank you. Right, yeah, exactly. Man, it's, a, it, it's an exploding one. That's great. I love it. So, uh, no <laughs> in and have you had the in and out burger yet? Have you got there yet? My boyfriend actually told me I needed to go while I was out here. So I did when I got in. Okay. And I have to say, Five Guys still has it beat. All right. All right. I got a Five Guys down the street from my house. I don't have In-N-Out, but I grew up on In-N-Out. But uh, I like it. Okay. Well, when you get to In-N-Out next time, tell me you want a double-double animal style with a hat. Oh, okay, yeah. Give that a try. <laughs> All right. Definitely. What's the one word? What's one word that describes you? Passionate. Definitely passionate. Well, no doubt. Uh, certainly got that from you today. So, hey, yeah. Kelly, you know, thanks for joining us on the show. I think, uh, you know, excited to, you know, follow this career of yours. And uh, I know others will be too. And, you know, best of luck here at Q School. And, uh, again, you know, really enjoyed it. So thanks for the time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This was a lot of fun. <laughs>